Try to shut us down and it ain't gon' slide Only thing I fear is God and he on my side That's the confidence of God cause he got me That's why I really feel like you can't stop me Greetings, Memorial West. I'm so glad to be able to share with you today. Our scripture reading is going to be found in Acts chapter 24, beginning at verse number 24. Acts chapter 24, beginning at verse number 24. Listen for the word of God. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. Now listen to this. I need you to tune in here. This is Acts 24, 27. When two years had passed, when two years had elipsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. This is the word of God for the people of God. And I'm glad we can say thanks be to God. Let us bow our heads in prayer, prepare our hearts for prayer. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your many blessings, particularly the blessing of your word that has become flesh and dwelt among us. We ask now, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you open our ears that we may hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That you open our hearts that we may receive it and that you strengthen our hands so we can be doers of the word and not just hearers only. God, we praise you for all that your word will and has and is accomplishing. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. That my words be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. That our, the meditation of our heart also be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen, family. In this fifth part of our series, The Long-Term Commitment, coming from Acts 24, uh, 24, it's focusing on that verse 27 that says, when two years had passed, when two years had passed, I want to tag this title today, The Will to wait. The will to wait. For all those who will be honest with me, you know that waiting can get on your last nerves. Yeah, they say that uh, delayed is not denied, but when things are delaying, even though it's not denying, it can be disturbing. It can be disturbing. During my time in the military, we had a phrase that uh, really referred to when you set an appointment and you went to go meet that appointment. The phrase was, hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Because you need to get to your appointment on time. And on time in the military is 15 minutes before the time of the start of the appointment. But turns out that you were just hurrying to your appointment to wait. And you'd be sitting there for 45, uh, sometimes 45 minutes. What, what the outcome was, 
really in that moment was frustration. You, you spend your time being on time and then you're told that you have to wait a little more time. And then after that, you're just frustrated because waiting even for a little bit can get on your last nerves. If there's one person here that can testify with me that you, you, you had a moment where you had to sit in the car behind traffic and you had somewhere you had to go and you're wondering what is going on? Why is everyone driving so slow? <laughs> because you, you don't want to wait. Waiting can get on your nerves. You make a plan to meet someone at a certain time and you, you, you change your schedule to get there on time only to find out that they're 25, 30 minutes late. Come on, <laughs> be, be honest with me. You make a, a date with your significant other and you put all the stuff together so you can be ready on time only to find out that as you're finishing getting ready, they're just starting to get ready. I know I have one person that can witness with me that can testify that in between that first and 15th sometimes feels like a thousand years when you're broke <laughs> because waiting can get on your last nerves. And what we're what we're experiencing while we while we wait is the production power of waiting, the production power of waiting, waiting can produce some emotions in our life and some character traits in our life it can produce when when you when you're just waiting it can produce anxiety so you get this image of you uh, trying to get to work on time and being stuck in traffic and it's so much anxiety because you need to get to work and so you don't have a will to wait you're trying to to get to where you're going and then the waiting produces a sort of anxiety when you're jobless, okay, when you're unemployed and you're waiting to see if, if your application for the job came through, waiting can produce some anxiety. But it also can produce anger. When you're waiting, you can become angry. If you've got a tight schedule and people aren't on time, it can produce anger because you're trying to get things done and people are holding you up. It also can produce apathy that over time as you're waiting, you begin to care less. When you've been trying to do something, you can you can sort of burn out and then you just really don't care how it turns out. This happens with what we call senioritis in education, right? So when you become a senior, whether it be in high school or whether it be in college, you get to that point where you're just in a slump. You don't feel like doing anything. You just want it to be over because waiting can produce a sort of apathy where something takes too long to manifest. And so it doesn't really become that important to you. Waiting can produce some, some real problematic things in our lives. Waiting can produce some problematic things in our life. But what if I told you that waiting isn't the problem? What if I told you that waiting waiting wasn't the problem? What if I told you that your will to wait, your orientation towards waiting is the difference between arriving to the place God has for you and jumping off the narrow road too soon. What, what if I told you that your will to wait is the difference between arriving to the place that God is taking you and jumping off the narrow road before you get to that destination? What is important that we see arise from our text is that the will to wait also produces some powerful things in our life. The will to wait produces powerful things in our lives. Listen to what scripture has to say about waiting when you have the will to wait. Lamentation 325. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Let's let's look at some more Bible. Psalms uh, 27, Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You don't like that one? Maybe, maybe you're familiar with Isaiah 40, 31. They who wait on the Lord 
shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. Maybe you haven't heard this one, though. Habakkuk 2, 3. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. Hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. I mean, we can go on all day. Psalms 37, 7. Psalm 135 through 6. Micah 7, 7. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Your commitment is not tested in moments when God shows up on your timetable. Your commitment is tested in the moments that you have to wait. I think our text this morning highlights what happens when we foster a will to wait. There's going to be some times where God doesn't show up when you, when you want God to show up. The old saints used to say that he may not come when you want him, but he's there on time. But when you experience that, it that on time is God's time. Right? So you have to foster this will to wait. And I think this morning our text highlights how the will to wait can produce some things in our life. Listen, listen at the text. Paul is presented to Felix in Caesarea. Okay? Is this guy. Tertullus, who presents the accusations before Felix, and he presents it in a calculated way because Tertullus wants a fear of rebellion to be associated with Paul. Okay, so he brings this information, tells that he's stirring up uh, social unrest and riot, and, and he's the ringleader of this new uh, Jewish sect entitled The Way. And so what Tertullus is trying to create is a sort of fear, a fear that if Paul is left to his own devices, he will cause a rebellion. So Paul steps forward to give a defense. Basically, he's saying what you're saying is false and you can check the facts. What Tertullus is saying is not true. You can check the facts about it. He wasn't stirring up an argument or a crowd when he was discovered in Jerusalem. In fact, when Paul was discovered in Jerusalem, Paul was finishing up a purification ritual. And so Paul concludes that the only problem that they really have with me is that I said uh, about the resurrection of the dead. That's the only problem that they really can bring up because I didn't do what they said that I did. And so Felix rules to keep Paul in custody because Felix is somewhat knowledgeable of the way. He says he's he says he's waiting for Lysias, the tribune. But in the meantime, in the, during the wait, Felix and his wife Drusilla invite Paul to teach them about Christ and about the way of Christ. And so Felix and his wife, his wife is Jewish, uh, sent for Paul to hear him teach and preach about faith in Christ Jesus. And so we have this text where Paul is coming before Felix. The Bible says that he's teaching them about righteousness and self-control and, and the final judgment. And Felix is afraid of what Paul is saying, but still wants to continue this conversation. The problem is, two years passed. Paul's content as he's talking to Felix and Drusilla is, is succinct. Paul, he's talking about justice. He's talking about self-control, being able to master one's own sensual appetite. And he's talking about the coming judgment. But in this frightens Felix. But Felix continues to call Paul because Felix thinks that Paul's going to try to bribe him. And then we arrive at the center text. We arrive at the center text. It says, to Years had passed. What? So you're supposed to be waiting for Lysias the Tribune. That's what you told. That's what you said. That's why Paul's in custody. 
two years passed. That was 30 seconds. Some of y'all was antsy thinking there was a technical difficulty in 30 seconds. Two years passed. Two years. And Paul's waiting. No lysis. Two years. Paul's waiting. No prophecy. Two years. Paul's waiting. No circumstantial shifts. Two years. Paul's waiting. The Holy Spirit doesn't show up. Two years. Paul's waiting. There's no Damascus-like experience or breakthrough. Two years. Paul's waiting. No prison doors open, no matter how hard he prays or how loud he sings. Two years. No miracles done. Two years. No demons cast out. Two years. Paul is in custody and nothing happens. He's waiting. Felix transfers power to Porcius Festus and in an attempt to appease the Jewish population, Festus leaves Paul in prison. So Paul is, is in prison not for a crime, but because of someone else, else's preference. And this text shows us what happens when you have the will of to wait. What kept Paul strong in the faith, being able to stand and talk about justice when he wasn't receiving none, self-righteousness in front of people with no integrity, self-control in front of people with no integrity? What kept Paul talking about the judgment to come when the judgment in his faith was so corrupt? What kept Paul was the will to wait. The will to wait. Because the will to wait produces patience. The first thing that the will, the will to wait produces is patience. Simply waiting does not produce patience. I'm going to say that again. Simply waiting will not, cannot, and does not produce patience. You have to be you have to be willing to wait. Because you can patiently wait or you can anxiously wait. And that's going to depend on your will to wait. Let's say that you make a reservation for your significant other. You make a reservation at this restaurant that's your favorite restaurant and you go to meet with this person but that person is still getting ready and you're looking at your watch and you're like we're going to be late what you're referring to you're going to be late to what you're going to do which is eat dinner you're going to be late to the restaurant but you're not going to be late for the date because the date is with the person you care about. The shift is from waiting for the what, which will produce anxiety, to waiting for the who, which is how we begin to foster patience. I don't want to go just on a date with anyone. I want to go on a date with that specific someone, my wife. I, so I, I don't want to go to my favorite restaurant with just anyone. I want to eat at my favorite restaurant with a my favorite person. You see what I'm saying? So it's a move from thinking about what you're doing to who you're with while you're doing it. Patience, friends, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is being summoned to Felix. There's no mention of Paul being angry or fidgety or anxious. No element, no element in the text or in any of Paul's testimony that he is disgruntled with God because Paul realizes even though he's going to evangelize the Gentiles, he has to wait for the Lord to take him there. 
because it's not just what he's going to do. It's who's empowering him to do it. It's not just what he's going to say. It's where those words come from. And so Paul is learning patience. And I'm in my spiritual imagination, I think that as he pins the letter to the Romans in chapter 12, verses 10 through 12, he may be envisioning his moment waiting. He says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. But here's what he says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Patient in tribulation. So here, Paul is learning how to be patient, even though everything around him says that he should be anxious. How to be at peace, even though everything around him says that he should be disgruntled. And so, the will to wait will produce patience when you move from thinking about what you're doing to who you're doing it with. When you move about what you're doing for the Lord, to realizing that you're doing it with the Lord. Amen? But it also will produce perseverance. The will to wait will produce perseverance. Waiting doesn't stop the trials of life. In fact, James 1.12 suggests that the person is blessed who remains steadfast under trial. For as they were withstanding the test of time, they receive a crown of life. According to first, uh, it's according to James one, okay, but it's interesting that as you're reading through Romans, Paul constantly refers to what he is experiencing when we read in Acts. In Romans five, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace, in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. This term translated perseverance from the Greek refers to a characteristic of a human who is not swerved from purpose not swerved or shifty from loyalty in the midst of trial of great or great suffering. So in other words, they're not changed based on the things that are happening around them. They're able to, to find center and to focus on the purpose that God has for their life. Paul has in him ideas towards Rome. But Paul hasn't plotted the course to get there. In Acts 19.21, Paul purposed in his spirit that he will pass through Macedonia. And the, and the text says, after I've been to Macedonia, Paul says, I must also see Rome. But Paul doesn't know how he's going to get to Rome. In Acts 20.22, 20, he says, now I go bound to the spirit, to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me in Jerusalem. So Paul has this mind for Rome and knows that he has to get through Jerusalem. Waiting is what gets him from Jerusalem to Rome. Waiting is a precursor to the platform that God is going to take you to. And many people want this, evol this uh, elevation to a platform before they get the revelation of waiting, the revelation of preparation. The time in between the vision God lays on your heart and the steps you need to take to get there. Listen, elevation without revelation ends in devastation. I'm going to say that again just for my note takers. Elevation without revelation ends in devastation. Some places you will never get to in your own power. Some places you can't plan to get to, some places you can't strategize to get to, some places you can only reach by enduring commitment to God and having a will to wait. So the will to wait produces patience, it produces perseverance, and last but not least, the will to wait produces perspective. They say that perception is reality. And let me add this caveat to it. Perception is reality until you realize it's not. 
until you realize that your vision is a very far, very small picture as to what is actually going on. Your eyes, if you depend on them, can make you think the world is flat. And some people, you've been depending on your eyes, what you can see. You've been trying to live in a round world with a flat perspective. We can know that Paul's perspective changes by how Paul handles his next defense. We've already seen as we're traveling through Acts, Paul defend himself multiple times. But here, after this experience of two years, being in captivity without a trial has changed Paul's perspective. Up until this point, Paul has simply said that he was innocent. And after he says that he's innocent, he shares his testimony. But in chapter 25, Festus tries to take Paul back to Jerusalem. And Paul says, hold up, I'm innocent and you know it. If I did something deserving of death, then kill me. But if there's nothing in these accusations, you have no right to touch me. But here is the shift. The perspective shift. I appeal to Caesar. I said that Paul had Rome in mind before persecution. We find that earlier on in, in Acts, that Paul has in his mind to get to Rome. And now he's found a way for his enemies to be a footstool to the stage of Rome. So his perspective has shifted from something that is happening to him to something that is happening for him. And when you have the will to wait, persecution changes from being a threat to being a tool. Persecution changes from threatening your purpose to tooling, from threat, threatening your person to tooling your purpose. And at this point, Paul has Rome in his sights and has found a way to use what people are trying to use against him for his benefit. Perspective is the difference between being anxious and being patient while you wait. And when you're caught up in the circumstances, waiting will cause anxiety. But when you concentrate on Christ, Waiting can produce patience, waiting can produce perseverance, and waiting will produce perspective. As I come to a close, I give you this final illustration. And Super Bowl 51 has happened in 2017. I was still in Georgia, and me and my wife went to our in-law's house. And I, at that time, was a New England Patriots Fan. Tom Brady was my boy. I'm still a New England, a New England Patriots fan, even though they had a bad season this year. But I'm a New England Patriots fan, and I am in Georgia. So I go to, to the Super Bowl party, and I'm rooting for New England. And I'm the only one there, because we're in, in, in Georgia. And in Super Bowl 51, I was the only New England fan, fan because they were playing in Super Bowl 51, 2017. The Atlanta Falcons. I mean, we sat down there. We got all of our snacks. We got our wings. We had our Pepsis and Colas. And we're sitting there. and We're watching this game. And it's the, the first quarter. And nobody scores. It's, it's the first, first quarter. And it seems like everything is going to be okay. But then Atlanta starts pushing forward. Atlanta starts pushing forward and it gets real scary because at halftime, New England only has six points. And so from the perspective of the fan, it looks dim because at halftime, New England is losing by a lot. At halftime, it seems as though the game is over, that Atlanta is about to be the Super Bowl champions for Super Bowl 51. And the per perspective of the fan, me sitting there, it looks dim. But the perspective of the coach says the game isn't over. 
And so even though at halftime, it looked like Atlanta had taken the final Super Bowl. They were going to be the Super Bowl champions. But by the end of the game, New England had an amazing comeback for ending score 34 to 28. Because what looks like to a fan, them, looks like the game ain't over to a coach. And this reminds me, friends, of Jesus hanging on the cross. You get this picture of the Messiah, Savior of the world. Life is coming from his body and it's halftime. The fans think the game is over. The disciples are de depressed and distressed, wondering what is happening to their leader. But the coach says the game ain't over. Even though it looks dim, the coach says the game isn't over. What looks like crucifixion is about to be resurrection. What looks like death is about to be life. What looks dim to the fan looks bright to the coach. And I know you're losing in life. But the game ain't over. I know you may be losing in parenthood, but the game ain't over. I know you may be losing in your relationship or on your job or in your ministry, but the game isn't over. And what looks like a loss is about to be a win. What looks like defeat is about to be a victory. What looks like an upset, a down and out, is about to be an uplift. Wait on the Lord, friends. And be of good courage. Because God has a way when you're waiting of shifting your perspectives so that you can realize that all things work together for the good of those who love God to them who are called according to his purpose. Wait on the Lord. So that the word of God can manifest in your life that says, And all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. That neither life, neither death, nor life, angels or principalities, nothing present or future, no powers, no height or depth, nothing in creation will separate us from the love of God. Friends, stay committed. And stay committed by having the will to wait. Amen. That's why I really feel like you can't stop me.